calling it anti-Semitism, worrying about anti-Semitism or focusing on anti-Semitism is really not the best way to go about it. Because there are all sorts of hatreds, some of them even more dangerous than the anti-Semitism. So rather than focus on the hate um, of a particular group, we need to focus on morality in general. People need to be moral. If they're moral, they won't be anti-Semitic and they won't be anti-Asian. And they won't be anti-anything. They'll be good people. So it, it's really a kind of a distraction from the moral issue when we make, you know, when we make it a, an anti-Semitic act or uh, a homophobic act. The, these, these specifications just make it more murky. We need more morality across the board. We need well, to I be more been. honest. We need to be more peaceful. We need to be more respectful. We're, we're, we're a country without values. I think it's a real challenge we face, uh, Rabbi, that the world is moving so fast these days that uh, people have lost a sense of values. I remember I went to Catholic grade school and Catholic high school and Catholic college and Catholic law school. But I remember in grade school, a nun saying that, uh, you know, the world is moving so fast these days. I was born in 1962, so this is in the 60s and 70s. The nun says, the world is moving so fast these days and that was the space race at the time and advances in medicine and television and the world is moving so fast that we haven't had a chance to stop and figure out how it's affecting us we haven't had a chance to stop and think about it and between the fast moving nature of things technology globalization so many other factors that have resulted in the tearing down of our institutions we're losing basic values i think that uh, anti-semitism is a real thing I think it's growing, uh, but I agree with you that this lack of value is values is pervading all of our culture right now. I mean, just, you know, the 10 commandments, you know, thou shalt not lie. I mean, <laughs> we're losing, we're losing on some of the most basic things Yeah, and it's pervading all of our culture. It almost seems if I'm not being a little paranoid, it almost seems like it's not just benign neglect. There seems to be a purposeful plan, an intentional plan to tear down our values, to, to, to mock them, and to uh, raise a whole generation with complete lack of morals, amoral. I mean, if you think about, you see a group of teenagers on a street corner, and they're talking excitedly. What are they talking about? Mm. It's frightening. No, they're not discussing the Ten Commandments. <laughs> they never heard of them. They've never heard of the Ten Commandments. They don't know if that's part of the uh, amendment to the Constitution. They, they have no idea what it is. They certainly don't know what the commandments are. But I had this re in Minnesota, I had this uh, young Russian immigrant who claimed to be an atheist, he doesn't believe in anything, he's not religious, he was raised in communist Russia. One day he comes to me and says, I can't believe it. I took a ride into the, uh, into the country, into the farm area, and I see this booth at the side of the road selling vegetables, so I stopped to buy some vegetables, but there's nobody there. So I waited, nobody there. And then I realized there isn't going to be anybody. There's a can hanging on the, on, the, on the post full of money. And there are little signs by each bushel saying, you know, this is 25 cents and this is 50 cents. And people actually paid when there was nobody there. He said, it blew my mind. In Moscow, we take in the side view mirrors at night. We take the battery in at night. Well, in Russia, this booth would disappear in, an, in a minute. I mean, first the money, then the vegetables, then the wood of the, of, of the, of the 
He says, how, how is this possible? How is it possible that when nobody is watching, people actually pay? Not only don't take from the from the can, they actually put money in the can. He says, I think I'm starting to believe in God. Mm. This doesn't come from the Constitution or from democracy or from politics. It comes from the Bible. And the democracy was working as long as the Bible was there to support it. Take the Bible out. Democracy doesn't work. Well, since uh, since Adam and Eve, since the beginning of time, there's been this battle between good and evil. And uh, we've seen throughout the history of the Jewish people, and I would argue fulfilled in the Christian people, but uh, we've seen this march forward in human history uh, in this battle between good and evil. And we've put in different structures in place. I would argue that democracy is in place because of... Uh, uh, the view that there's an intrinsic worth in every human being and that we had to look out for every human being. And that's where democracy came from, which is, comes from our faith, I believe. And uh, there's been always been this battle. And we've seen uh, uh, evil triumph on occasion and good triumph on occasion. And right now we're in a challenge because as going back to what I was saying originally about how fast things are moving, that we haven't really figured out how these things are affecting us. So social media, for example, right now, you know, Tom Friedman wrote a book, uh, Thank You for Being Late. And in the book, he talked about how social media is great for the makers, the people who want to do good things and make things. And spread. look at you, you're, you know, using technology to spread your, your, your message on YouTube. So technology and, and social media, they're good for the makers, but it's also good for the breakers, the people that want to tear everything apart. And, uh, I would argue that there are, you know, you said before you didn't want to be paranoid, but there are forces in the world right now, not just the, you know, good versus evil dark forces, but, you know, our foreign adversaries versus the United States of America, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, that are using social media and are trying to sow civil unrest to get us to all uh, dislike each other, to not have faith in each other, to say, ah, it's all a bunch of, you know, and, and to tear it down. And they want to do that because they don't like this idea that every human being has intrinsic worth and should be treated with human dignity. And they are taking some other systemic challenges we face right now and they're exacerbating it. And they're putting fuel on the fire to try and further tear us up. Black Lives Matter versus Blue Lives Matter. That's a real debate. There's no question that there's a debate there about racial injustice and about the role of police. No question about it. But you'll take the most extreme voices on each side and you'll amplify it in social media. And I would argue our, our adversary, we know the Russians did this. They're taking these messages and they're amplifying it. Anti-Semitism, they're amplifying it. Anti-Asian, they're amplifying it. Any chance there is to amplify a chance for civil unrest are foreign adversaries. They want us to hate, you know, George Washington or Christopher Columbus or whoever it is. Everybody's got these flaws. They want to amplify what's wrong with us and, and distract from their own problems. Uh, so it's a real battle that uh, it all comes back to, as you said, these basic idea of having basic moral values. Yeah, it, it seems like they're taking liberal principles to their absurd conclusion. Mm. And they're using it against us. Oh, you're so liberal, then why do you discriminate between men and women? Mm. Why do you even have men and women? Mm. Who says you have to be a man or a woman? It, it, they're just mocking our whole set of, of, of principles because, again, without the Ten Commandments and without God in the picture, Love your neighbor. Yeah, it's a joke. Turn the other cheek. Are you kidding? <laughs> so they're, they're, they're finding the flaws in liberalism and they're, and they're turning it against us. Yeah. It's almost like they're laughing all the way to the bank. And the challenge again, we're moving, we're, we're, we're not stopping and thinking and, and talking like we're talking now to just try and think of, you know, 
how are we how are these things that are moving so quickly affecting us and what can we do to slow it i mean the pandemic in a way with all of its curses uh was a blessing that it got us to slow down uh spend more time with our families uh not be rushing not spending you know all that extra time not commuting gave us a chance to stop and think a little bit yeah um so it's you know the fact that you and I can talk right now. I mean, this wouldn't happen were it not for uh, uh, the use of Zoom, which came out of uh, uh, the pandemic. So there are blessings that have come with this as well. Um, so practically speaking, if we want to correct the situation, we need to reintroduce God into our lives, and the most logical and the best place to do that is in grade school. So the Rebbe came up with this idea of a prayer at the beginning of the day, which always existed until somebody decided to tear it away from us. And then that became too controversial. What kind of prayer? And so the Rebbe said, how about a moment of silence? Start the day with a moment of silence, a moment to think. Like you say, we're not thinking. Mm. So get kids to think at the beginning of the day. Why am I at school? What's going on? What am I supposed to be doing? And of course, they're not going to know what to think. So they're going to ask their parents, which gets the parents to think. And then the teacher is sitting there for a minute quietly thinking, what am I doing here? It would change the entire atmosphere. The school spirit everything would change just stop for a minute give it a little thought people will come to good conclusions because people do want to be good they love to be challenged and i keep talking about this you know uh, kennedy's statement ask not what your country can do for you I think that was the only time in all the inaugural speeches of all the presidents that the president didn't promise to do good for you, but challenged you to do good. And Mm. and it's the most popular, well-remembered sentence of all. So people love being challenged and especially young people. So we got to get them on board, not just not committing crimes, We've got to get them to champion goodness, godliness. And and they'll do a magnificent job if we just invite them, tell them that they're important. So a moment of silence in the in the public school would really change. And every school that has done this so far has glowing reports, less less bullying, less fighting better attention, better attendance. I think in Florida, they they passed it as a legal uh, requirement that the day in school has to begin with with a moment of thought or a thoughtful moment. I I, I like the idea of everybody slowing down and thinking like that. And uh, I want to, I, I heard before you make that comment about Kennedy, I thought that was great, great insightful comment on your part. And I, it made me think of, Kennedy also said, here on earth, God, God's work must truly be our own. And so uh, calling us again to try and uh, think of how we can make things better. I served as the, uh, as the co-chair of the National Prayer Breakfast. And uh, it was really a, a wonderful experience, but for the fact that, uh, our president at the time, President Trump, didn't really get quite get the spirit of the whole thing. Uh, the theme was, you know, love your enemies, and a uh, you know, very difficult concept. And uh, there was a wonderful speaker who spoke, and he talked about the idea that you know, loving your enemies doesn't mean you have to agree with your enemies, but let's stop holding each other in contempt. Let's sit down and let's debate, and we'll disagree with each other if necessary. But enough with the eye rolling. And enough with the attacking, and enough with you know tearing each other down. Uh, and I uh, think love your enemy means don't allow him to be bad. Don't don't give him license to be bad. 
He's your enemy, but he should be your friend. So if he's misbehaving, call him out. Expect morality from him. Because the worst thing you can do to a person is... Dumb it down. Expect less. Yeah, so love your, love your countrymen, love your country. That's all very cute. First, stop shooting me. Then we'll talk about love. I think it's a little premature. <laughs> we're shooting each other, but we're trying to love each other. Now, that, that makes us crazy. We're not ready for love, but we must have morality. Don't love me, but you have no right to shoot me. <laughs> you know, you don't have to respect dogs, but you're not allowed to kick them. Mm. So let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Yeah, we've got a lot to figure out, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, let's stick to the basics. Rabbi, the, the, uh, the concept of God I think is misinterpreted in some respects. Um, it just so happens today uh, in the newspaper, there was an obituary of a leading voice in the religious, quote, death of God movement, a man by the name of Richard Rubenstein, who uh, he wrote a book called Death of God about how Auschwitz um, invalidated the idea of an omnipotent, benevolent deity who safeguards Jews as the chosen people. Is that too deep? Is that a question or a statement? <laughs> well, it's just relevant because um, the, the concept of, you know, if there was a God, how can there be so much tragedy and death and maiming and killing and oppression and all that? It's a very good question. But that's only half the story. You know, it hasn't been that long ago that the Holocaust happened. And look how well Jews are doing. How about that side of the story? The world tried to destroy the Jews and the Jews are thriving. Take a bigger picture. You know? Get a bird's eye view of what's going on. So yes, it's a big puzzle. Why is there pain and why is there suffering? Why is there death at all? And not just among humans, but in nature. Why do things decay? Why is everything decaying? What kind of world is this? Things exist, but they all die. They all decay. They all rust. They all... So it's, it's, it's a strange world that God created. But in this strange world, there are magnificently good, holy, godly things going on. And that's what needs our attention. The pain, we all know pain. You don't have to write books about pain. You have to write books about godliness. So it's not really the death of God at all. It may be the death of religion. In fact, I, I, I don't like to call myself religious. I'm not interested in being religious. But if God created the world with a purpose and I'm here because of that purpose, well then, I want to know what that purpose is. And I don't, I don't have to call it a religion, which can be very divisive. So I'm not promoting religion, but morality, which comes from God, not from the religious institutions, which are basically failing. Which are basically what? Failing. All the institutions are failing. They've become too institutional. Mm. You know, you talked about uh, the Holocaust and about the, the success of the Jews the other, as well. I, I, I always like to point out though, that in the world, there are, I have, I, there are 2.4 billion Christians in the world. 2.4 billion Christians. There are 1.9 billion Muslims in the world, 1.2 billion Hindus in the world, 500 million Buddhists in the world, 26 million Sikhs. There's only 15 million Jews in the world. So, and 6 million were killed during the Holocaust. So I, you know, 
Whenever my friends say, what, what's the, what are you making such a big, I, I, you can understand why they'd be a little concerned by people picking on them a little bit. I can under, I listen to your point, Rabbi, which is, you know, let's not focus on this so much. Let's, you know, let's focus on morality. Let's focus on, you know, all people, how all people are treated. Uh, but I, you know, anti-Semitism is a real thing. I mean, there's no question about it in my mind. And uh, I've, I've been thinking a lot about uh, you know, I have a lot of Muslims in my district as well, a lot of Pakistanis. And I've been thinking about the Muslim, I've been thinking about the, 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 the view of the Palestinians and the Israelis. And uh, I'm, very, I'm very strong pro-Israel, uh, but it's, you know, it's such a big issue of the Palestinians, the oppression of the Palestinians. I mean, you know, there's a million Uyghurs, more than a million and a half Uyghurs in, in, in Western China that are living in forced labor camps right now. And you don't hear rallies for the Uyghurs. Uh, there are Muslims being persecuted in, in all kinds of places throughout the world. Uh, and it's really not, that ha does not have the same emphasis of the Muslims that are discriminated against in these other countries. It's always like, it's always, you know, Israel, Israel, Israel. Uh, but again, if we're not moral, we're not going to be moral. We'll find any excuse to beat up on whoever we can, you know, the, the, the most convenient victim at hand, but our job is not to protect ourselves. I mean, that's necessary, of course, but that's not our mission in life. The mission in life is to make the world a more godly place. <clears throat> and that's, that's colorless, you know, without religious distinction. The world has to be the way God wants it to be. And if, if only Jews were behaving themselves, it would make no impact. The whole world is either going to be good or it's not going to be good. So we're in this together. We're all here for the same purpose. And even if we go about it with different uh, methods or different ways, but we all have to be going in the same direction. And that those are the Ten Commandments. That's, that's God, not religion. But then you introduce po politics and economics into the equation and power and, and the quest for power. And that somewhat muddies the water. Well, that becomes false gods. If we're not focused on the true God, then we develop all sorts of false gods. Money, power, politics, fame, celebrityhood, they're all gods. Substitute gods. And even principles like equality, um, fluid gender craziness, it's all false gods. It's all the desperation to, to create a substitute for God. And I, 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 I listened a lot to a guy named Bishop Robert Barron. He's, got a, he's the most followed Catholic on social media after the Pope. Uh, he's the bishop of Santa Barbara now. He came out of Chicago. He has a thing called Word on Fire. Very good. I should try and introduce the two of you sometime. And uh, he, he talks, I think it's St. Augustine. He talks about, you know, this, what do men desire? What do people desire? Pleasure, power, honor, and money. Those are the four false gods, the things that we seek. And it's natural, it's human desire to want those four things. But it's when we raise them up, he says, we will never be satisfied with those four things. And St. Augustine would say, my heart will not rest until it rests in thee, rests in God. And uh, we have to figure out how we cannot be lured by these four false gods all the time and figure out how to keep God centered on our life. Certainly I fail at it all the time. Uh, it's just a matter of, of, of trying to regain our focus. Well, my, my message has been the reason we can never have enough is because we don't really need it in the first place. Mm. It's like Chinese food. <laughs> you, know, you can't have enough because you never needed it. So a need that doesn't get satisfied is not a legitimate need. It's just pleasure for the sake of pleasure. And why would you ever say no to pleasure? But, it, but that which is a real need when you satisfy it, it is satisfied. So 
if we think we need these things, we're almost compelled to pursue them. I mean, I need it. No, you don't need it. You really don't need it at all. And that makes it much easier to turn attention away from that to what is true. It, when, to, to sum it up very briefly, we've convinced ourselves of how needy we are and religion made it worse by, by enlarging the need. You're so dependent on God. You're so helpless without him. You're so needy. He holds all the answers, all the keys. You, yeah, you got to be on his good side. Get on your knees, beg, cry, plead, apologize. It's so, it's so depressing. The truth is we're not needy. God needs because he created the world. So we have it so backwards. The creator of the universe needs nothing, but we guests in his universe, we are needy. Come on, that's backwards. God creates a universe. Of course, he needs something. You don't do that for no reason. We, on the other hand, <laughs> we had no say in the matter. So the fact that I need to eat, that's not my need. I didn't do this to myself. And many times I resent it. I don't want to be dependent on food. But nobody asked me. This is the way I was created. Dependent on food, dependent on sleep, dependent on, on security and on... I didn't do this to myself. So I really shouldn't call it my need. It's God's need. If I liberate myself from this burden of needs and it's gotten way too much i mean with the you know if you listen to the advertisements and the commercials there's no end to what we need and it's getting depressing so the the real answer is thinking that you need is playing god why would you need you didn't create anything God, the creator, obviously has a vast eternal need. And we're here to serve him. So lighten up and do something for him. It's a simple message. It's a simple truth. It's, it's, I think it's the key to happiness. Thinking about how needy you are is already depressing. Well, that's taking me off in a lot of directions, but I know we don't have much time left to talk to each other. But uh, I, I always have thought to my, you know, that God doesn't need anything. That God uh, wants us. He doesn't need us. And yeah, we, that's, that's the conventional wisdom. Yeah. And we always play this game of, uh, you know, God, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. You know, if I do this, will you do that for me? Which is, you know, that's for amateurs, I believe. You know, I think gratitude is a very big part of life is, you know, just yeah. thank God for what I have when I have it. Yeah. I think when I was talking to an 11 year old boy. Yeah. And I said something, you know, you got to do what God needs. He says, God doesn't need, he wants. I'm sure he was taught in school. So I said to him, you mean God wants what he doesn't need? And the boy said, oh, no, I guess not. Even at 11 years old, if God wants what he doesn't need, he's frivolous. He's immature. Even a human being shouldn't want what he doesn't need. And clutter your life. So it, that doesn't work theologically. If he wants, then he, then he really wants. So it's not like, I want, but if it doesn't happen, that's okay too. What, that, that doesn't sound like God. So if he wants, he needs, and if he needs, he wants. And, and, and it's so intuitively correct. You create an entire universe, you're after something. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't respect you at all. No, we need, we need to be proactive. 
We're not allowed to sit by and watch more immorality uh, own the streets. We've got to get the people who have influence to use their influence. And just imagine, it was just a fantasy, like a dream. There's a riot going on. A bunch of young people are burning down the stores, burning police cars, turning things upside down, running off with merchandise. Imagine a very, very popular celebrity who they admire suddenly gets up on a car and says, hey, people, what are you doing? What were you born to destroy? Build the neighborhood. I think they'd love it. But celebrityhood is wasted. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal. It's questions and answers. It's conversation. It's really relaxed. It's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program. There's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look, click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best and join us for some enjoyable conversation.